Hello everybody, it is Ebontis, and welcome to Sworn. This is a up to four player co-op action roguelike set in the Camelot picture Knights of the Round Table and King Arthur kind of Holy Grail universe, which is a pretty unique setting. And the art is actually done by the gentleman who did the original writing and art for the Hellboy comic. So you've got some of these like deeper black lines and kind of dark shadows and brushstrokes and stuff. Very cool aesthetic. I really kind of enjoy the playthrough and the look of it so far. And on top of that, it's got really cool combat and very unique characters, classes, weapons, upgrades, blessings. It's a roguelike. Every run is going to have some randomness to it. But I will tell you, there are so many different ways to tackle what is ahead of you down there. Um, you're going to find stuff that works, stuff that doesn't work. And also for your own play style, you're going to find things you really like and things that don't quite mesh with you. And that's totally fine. Now, before I go any farther, I do want to thank Team 17. This is a sponsored video, and I was lucky enough to have been playing this for quite a while now, so I've had some, some time in this under my belt, so I'm able to be pretty comfortable with what I'm showing you guys, and that's thanks to the early access that I've had, so thank you guys for that, Team 17. So that out of the way, my goal with this video is to provide new players a bit of an introduction to kind of an action roguelike so they know what they're getting into and some ways to have some good steps forward so they don't stumble right out of the gate. But also for veteran players, I want to cover, you know, Merlin's upgrade trees and what the best ways there are to get started there. The character classes, the weapons, and the spells because there's 64 different options and I'm not even... Op done opening them all and I definitely don't have time to cover them all weapon upgrades and the way they can change how weapons truly feel and play and then also the Fisher King over here the encyclopedia of all the Fey blessings that you can get because when we're dealing with Camelot we're also not dealing with your standard you know Greek or Norse mythology we're dealing with the Fey Lords which is a different mythology than probably most of us are used to so first thing I want to start off is the new player items. But again, if you're more of a veteran player, you can use the timestamps to jump around to what section you find beneficial. But I hope all of you learned something from this. And if you do enjoy anything you see here or you're just curious about the concept of the game from what I said already, go to Steam right now because during the Steam Next Fest from June 10th to June 17th, the demo is available and I recommend picking it up. You can play Biome 1 and now Biome 2 and do everything that I'm showing you in here because I've been having a lot of fun with this and I think you'll probably have a lot of fun if you check it out too. All right, new players, you're first. Veterans, jump ahead if you want to. Now, for a new player, the most important thing when it comes to a roguelike is your health. So anytime an attack is coming at me, I want to make sure I'm not in the way. And your dash is probably your most important thing to do that. You notice I can dash through the attack. So if you've never played a roguelike before or a souls-like, those are called invincibility frames. And that's your whole goal is to make sure you've always got a dodge. So I'm just tapping dodge as much as I can. Now I have two dodges, but they're still on a little bit of a cooldown. So you always got to know that you need to kind of save those for when you need it. And then you can go in for your attacks. And you don't always have to be like behind them, but if you are, it can have a nice benefit. These guys are a little bit different. They're gonna charge and run into a wall. So then I know, but even if he's charging at me, I can charge through him and I'm not gonna get hit. So just learning your combination, like I can go one, two, three for a quick attack, but if he's gonna rear up and try and charge at me, I wanna make sure that when I know he's gonna make that noise, maybe that's when he attacks, yep. So I don't wanna be near him when that happens. Now. In this specific roguelike for Sworn, what you're gonna be doing is you go through chambers, just like this one. And then when you finish that room, you kill all the enemies, you're gonna get whatever the benefit that that room's gonna give you. And these two doors are gonna be a good example. So when you come over here, this is gonna be a chance for you to choose a blessing. Now what the blessings do is you can see this one's gonna be the Ignite one. I know it because I know these very well. And this is the Snowflake, it's gonna have the option to chill. Well, I'm gonna choose this one just because it's typically more fun. So you can see here, I've got common blessings that I can choose. This one randomly was epic. So I can have my dash be a little more powerful because it rolled an epic one. It could have been common, it could have been legendary, it could have been rare, uncommon, you got a lot of rarities. But your basic thing that you guys can see is my light attack will ignite. It does 150% bonus damage, but it only does it every eight seconds. Well, my light attack, I can swing my sword very quickly, so this doesn't really mesh that well, and I'll go deeper into kind of this thought process later. But of my choices here, honestly, either my heavy attack, since I could do the spin, but even that one I probably do more frequently. So the one that makes the most sense is every six seconds, 
my dash will cause me to immolate, which allows me to burn people as I dash around the room. So every so often, I'm just going to set people on fire. So we're just going to roll with that one. And then when you pick the blessing, then you're going to be presented with doors. So when you work through Sworn, you're going to have doors that will potentially give you currency like this one. You're going to have some that look like they have the banner, just like I had down below, which are going to be a blessing to alter your abilities or give you some benefits to kind of this run through. And this is an option for currency, but it's also got elite enemies. When you see a skull with elite enemies, that means the run in that room, if you can finish it, is going to give you a, a bonus. So it's going to give you double the rewards. So the currency would be 20 instead of 10, for example, when you run in there. That's the basics, though. From there, it's going to be, so you can see the burning below my feet. Lasts for a pretty good while. And then it's going to be back in about three seconds. So not too long after I dodge, like my next set of dodges, I'm going to be burning and anywhere I walk, I can set the enemies on fire. That is one of so many different buffs and benefits that you can have to your character. It's just one example. So we're going to take this room, for example, just because it's going to be a little bit easier for me to demonstrate a couple of things. When you come into the next room, same thing. You're also going to see things like traps. So this is an explosive barrel. You've got a little bit of a timer on that one. This is a trap of spikes if you're on it. Now you can see I'm sitting on that character and I'm just burning him by nearing him. Now this enemy, every time I get near it, it wants to jump away from me. But if I dash near it, I can sit there and burn it down. So you'll have traps. You'll have, you know, explosive uh, bombs. You'll have different arrows that will shoot out of walls. Occasionally you'll have a pot. You can see over there on the left side of the screen that actually has some gold in it. So check the pots. Just make sure there's none of them that are glowing. So I finished this room and I got some currency. Now over here, if I take this room on, I can get some gold that I could spend in a shop if I see one. Over here is a sword and a stone. So I'll show you this is my last one, and then we're going to go through all the other specific stuff. But this is just a couple of things about sword. The sword and the stone specifically is a unique buff. So you can see that's the big guy. And that's the elite enemy. So instead of a brute that does like just a slam down, his slam is much more unique because it has that chain effect to it. So I do not want to be there when that blast goes off. I want to be behind him. That's the more beneficial place for me to be. But the nice thing is I can drop that bomb down at his feet and I can blow him up for 100 damage and I can take a chunk out of him. Now, he's a bigger enemy. It's going to be a harder hit. But I put that bomb at his feet so I can kind of try and take him out. And again, you can see the enemies can set off the traps and sometimes catch you off guard. But if I've got a spell, boom, it goes off. And then he stepped on the trap and he died. Now, the Sword in the Stone is kind of unique to this because what it's going to do is it's actually going to change how your weapon works. And there are 16 different weapons, which we'll go over if some of them, but I'm not going to cover them all. But you can see my light attack is... 10% faster and or I move 10% faster and the light attack is 30% faster. Uh, my sword attacks deal more damage if I get a curse, which is one of those things you can acquire in the rooms. And the heavy attack shoots a vortex. So this one will look very different. So now my heavy attack will still do its spin, but I also shoot these vortexes out. And if somebody's in the path of the vortex, they're also going to take damage. So that is just a random thing that I get on this run. I'll go through a different run and I won't even see this benefit from my sword. So you're not going to have that as an option. But just a normal Fey Blessing from a normal room versus the one with the big elite enemy, probably going to go a lot faster. But I'll show you guys what this looks like with the... And this thing will travel through walls. Actually, no, it won't travel through walls. Some of them will. And a couple more hits here. There you go. So here we've got the option to either upgrade the blessing that I have. I've only got one, so that's probably not the greatest. Or I can choose the blessing with the uh, Queen of Spiders. And this is where I have the ability for my light attack to stack Venom. <laughs> that one's actually really cool. And now I've got 145 gold, so I could go in a shop. There are some things I could buy in here, and I'll show you what they are. Or you've got a secret shop. Now, these are a little bit cheaper because I've got some upgrades, but you can see if I have curse, I could remove some of that. Uh, my light attack will deal more damage, but these are all temporary buffs. When you start to have more gold, these actually look more appealing because, you know, you may as well spend the gold on something. 
moving a little bit faster for five chambers, cool, I'll stay alive. But also doing more damage for five chambers, if I've got money to spend and I don't know a shop's coming up, that can serve me well for quite a while. But if you go into a shop, there's not going to be any enemies in here, which is nice. And as you acquire more gold, normally these are 150 at first. I have exactly 150 right now by almost pure luck, basically. But I've also got an upgrade that makes the shop cheaper again. So it makes this a lot more manageable. Now I can buy a currency that I can use to unlock stuff. I can buy this, which would allow me to upgrade one of my blessings, which wouldn't be bad. Or I can just acquire a blessing. So now I could have my spell stagger. So my spell is the bomb. So it would get a 35% damage bonus and it would stagger. Well, stagger is something you want to build up. So that one's not going to be that great. Now my heavy attack where it spins and then continues to hit, doing more damage and also now staggering, that actually could have some cool benefits to it. So if you take this build and you start to see how some of the stuff is going, when I start my heavy attack and I'm able to build up stagger on all of these enemies i'm gonna stun half of the enemies that come through it and the other ones are just gonna walk into my spinning heavy attack and when i dash i can stand next to somebody and just cook him on fire he's stunned you guys kind of see how this is working so this is the idea i can pick up my currency and every so often in the rooms you're gonna have these little shrines they do a whole bunch of different stuff i don't know what this one does okay so what happens here is I can eat two, I can eat the mushroom and I gain two charges, which means I get two extra charges probably per room, but I lose my regeneration. So I'm not going to get it back. So right now I've only got two. So if I set a bomb down, blow it up, set a bomb down, blow it up, I'm not going to have any. But if I go into the next room, I should start with four. Depending on what your spell does, you may want to be able to blow through four quickly and not worry about the charge back. This is a mini boss. So you can see my spins are going to sit there and build up stagger on the boss. So now I can actually sit here and just swing on him. I'm sitting there burning him because I'm standing on him. My heavy attack swirls are sitting there doing damage to him. I'm standing near him, so it's burning him. You guys kind of see how this all starts to come together? Almost got him staggered again, so now I can just swing on him. And he's done. Now, I've done this many times, so I kind of understand his attack patterns. I still took about 52 damage. So I took a decent amount of damage in there, but that's how you get an emerald. First time you take that guy down and you get an emerald, those are extremely valuable, and I will tell you exactly where to put this. So let's go back to the main area, and I'm going to explain the best kind of order of buffs to get from Merlin, and then we're going to go through characters, weapon upgrades, blessings, synergies. But I wanted to give you guys a decent run-through for the opening to explain mechanics, doors. This one would get you maximum, like an increase to max health and give you health. So it would increase my max to 125, but it would give me the 25 on top of the, like on top of what I currently have at 48. So I'd be at 73. And then this one would give me just gold if I wanted that to go spend. So let's go back to the main hub and we're going to go over all the details. All right, so let's go through your currencies. The first one I'm going to talk about is your crystal shards. That is going to be the pink crystal shards that look like kind of a tall pillar. You're going to use those for two things. One, you're going to use those to unlock your weapons and spells for each of your characters and you're actually going to use them to unlock these two characters once you kind of make more progression the other reason that you're going to use the currency of crystal shards is you're actually going to be unlocking these nodes for the first time or these actual like trees for the first time because when you start you only have access to the life tree then it's going to take like 10 i think it's 20 it might be like 30 and 50 or something like that but it's going to give you access to these trees now, when it comes to weapon upgrades, I've seen a rare one that takes crystal shards, but believe me, I have not checked them all, so that's just some other place that they might get used. But most of them are just unlocks that eventually you're going to have most of it unlocked and viewable. Now, the other piece with regards to the crystal shards of unlocking all these trees is the grail water. The grail water is only spent in this screen, and that's it. So as you get grail water, these are my recommendations on how to spend it. Start here at the life tree because you have to start here. It's the only one you can see. You have to pick this one first because you always have to start at the bottom center of the tree anyway. 
And my recommendation, now this is as a solo player, if you're doing co-op, you can have some benefit of getting more health back when you're revived. But honestly, before you do anything else, try and bump up your maximum health. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. The Vigilante starts with 100 instead of 50 health, and the Rook starts with 125 instead of 75. Starting with more health, majorly beneficial. The number two thing I recommend you doing is coming over here, and I will tell you, you're going to want to try and beat the mini boss to be able to get this as quick as possible. Now, if you're struggling with the mini boss, we'll talk about that. But the first emerald that you get is going to need to go right here. So you'll need to spend a little grail water for some movement speed. But the first emerald that you get from the first mini boss that you kill needs to go right here before you do anything else with it. The second dash ability, having two back to back will save you so often because one you could use it but then still maybe be in that area of effect of some attack that's coming two will usually be able to one get you out of just about any pickle that you're in if they're both available usually get you out of reach of most attacks you can even do one up, up away and then one off to the side so you can really dodge most things because health is a very very valuable currency in this game as in many roguelikes it always is and being able to dodge and have more invincibility frames massive now, if you come up here, I chose to get an extra mana charge so I can use my spell more frequently. Technically, you can get a third chart, third dash up there. You can also get a third mana charge. I like to have two and two. That's just the preference. These get to be a bit more expensive, so it's kind of your choice when you work your way up this part of the tree. Now, from here, I'm going to give you two options, but you'll notice I will tell you just like me, Devotion is last. The only thing Devotion is going to do is going to allow the blessing options that you have when you're picking them during your run to have a small percent chance to be a little bit more rare. That's it. You should learn a lot more of the mechanics, the dodging, builds, and all of those things long before you worry about your blessings being slightly better. So save this for last. But you have two things. If you're getting to the point where you can beat the first mini boss, um, either of them potentially, then if you can do that, my recommendation is to open up treasure and you're going to have to choose this one first. So you have a breakable pot with crystal shards to earn, be earning some of those anyway. But when you defeat a boss, then you're going to have the chance to get 10, 20, 30 grail water every boss or mini boss you defeat. Each biome has a mini boss in which the mini bosses tend to have a little bit more randomness to them. And then the biome boss is going to be pretty much the same every time. But if you can beat Biome 1, but maybe Biome 2 is kicking your butt, with these three nodes unlocked, nothing else on this tree, but just these three, if you beat Biome 1, that is 60 Grail Water at a minimum, which allows you to start unlocking a whole bunch more stuff to make yourself more powerful every time. So if you're able to do the mini boss, prioritize this as quick as you can, because once that mini boss becomes consistent, then you're going to get these unlocks a lot quicker. If the mini boss is a struggle, you're, you've got your dodge, but the mini boss is still a struggle, still trying to get a little bit better at the game, but you've got grail water you want to spend. The health benefits here are pretty minimal. There's like, if you go all the way up this side, you would have a total of a 15% chance a room has a health pot and that's going to have 10 health. It's a chance, but it's not really that much. And also, if you go up this side, you'll get up to a total of each room you enter, you get three health. Well, every time you get hit, it's about 10 health most of the time, unless the enemy has been weakened. So it's going to take you three chambers just to get that health, three plus chambers to get that health back. It's a pretty small benefit. It would stack up over time, but it wouldn't be something I prioritize. If you're struggling with the mini boss, what I actually recommend doing, uh, if you feel like you're getting your movement speed going, you've got your max health up and you can't quite get to the mini boss yet, start getting yourself the ability to start off with gold because somewhere on your runs, you're going to be getting gold, whether it's 100 from a run, maybe you get 200 from something. Maybe you choose between, you know, two options on a banner and you can get gold. Gold is beneficial because you can buy benefits of that are temporary for like a certain number of chambers from the secret shops in the chambers. Or if you go to the full on shop, you can actually buy blessings and you can actually choose which one you want. You can buy max health. You can refill health. Gold can do really, really good things as you're working and getting used to fighting bosses. And as you work up this tree, it's not cheap. It's going to cost you a decent amount of grail water, but if you're working your way through multiple runs and you're building up grail water, but the boss is still tough, having gold... And up here, you can start with 75 gold. 
then you're going to be able to probably take one room that's a gold door and then you're going to have like 175 gold and then you can get like some decent buffs if you can get all the way up here with an emerald though i would say this is not a bad place to spend your second emerald because your shops being cheaper especially since you've already got the gold to start really gets you some nice benefits only until you're ultra fast would i mess with these on the side because what they're going to do is if you clear a room in under 20 seconds you can get a benefit of 15 bonus gold but early on you're probably not going to be that fast until you get some really good builds and start getting some abilities that synergize later on sure but right early on you know the gold can help you but then when you start taking out the mini boss again prioritize getting this grail water so you can start unlocking every other node in here so max life Get your second dash. If the mini boss is kind of coming along, work on the upgrades for the grail water. So upgrades in here are going to come quicker and then balance that between getting some more gold. You could slowly work on the health buffs, work your way up to the second dash or the second mana charge. All of this should be cleared up before you touch devotion because those percentages, the blessings are not going to be a game changer. Most of this stuff is going to help you in other ways, but that save that for last, in my opinion, and you're probably going to be happy that you did. So when you get started, you're going to have the Vigilante with the basic short sword and blade rush. Don't knock these though, they can work into some really cool builds. And also the Rook with the Great Hammer and the Counter Spell. So the Rook is going to be bigger and slower, but more powerful. And then the Vigilante is going to be quicker, a little bit more nimble, but a little weaker on the attacks. That alone is probably going to determine how you start playing the game. But as you work on unlocking more of these crystal shards, you can have the Vigilante now have a ranged bow attack, a little slower and steadier, but keeping things at range, and then a remote bomb, so if something does get close to you, you can blow it up. You can get a bow staff, so you can get some really fast attacks going to start stacking some buffs. And then you got the other side where the Rook can have like a massive cannon. It's got some of the biggest range and hits pretty hard from range, but maybe you need to get out of dodge so you've got the bull rush as opposed to a counter shield that's going to keep you immune for one damage. Massive axe with a big cleaving attack and then a sky drop so you can jump in the air. These two characters alone have a massive difference in how each of their weapons and spills can play, but they feel very different. When you unlock the specter, then you get into spells. So you've got this little armillary sphere that shoots little, little things, but if you can stack something... If you can stack a buff on something that shoots frequently, then you're talking. You've got Mystic Beam, which is pretty much just like a beam of energy. Dragon Dive, which is you're this like little dragon egg that smashes into something. You can have Spirit Guardians, which are little turrets that just autonomously fire, which is kind of fantastic. And then a Teleport, Land, and Blast, kind of like the Stomp in the Air. The weapons you can get, the Scythe is really cool. The Claws do some really crazy stuff. And then you come over to the Monk, which is going to be similar to the Rook and a little bigger, a little slower. And also the Monk and the Rook start with 25 more health than the Spectre and Vigilante. These start with 50. These start with 75. But again, always go for that max health as quick as possible. So you're starting with 100 and 125. Here you've got things like a book that can, you know, shoot pages in volleys and focused volleys. You've got chimes that can come from a bell. Sounds weird, but believe me, it actually can put in some work. And then you've got crystal turrets that you can place on the ground and run away from and they're still going to attack so you don't even have to be anywhere nearby you also can cast lightning from the sky you can cast lightning from the sky with your heavy attack but if things get close you can smack them with the big mace the play styles here are going to take you a little bit to experiment because i could say hey you could play the vigilante but do you want to play the short sword where you're close and doing these attacks where you're like okay i got swing attacks and i got that and then i can dash away does that feel like a good playstyle to you or does something like the bow where you're over here and I've got to pull back and draw and if I get my timing right I get that little white flash so I get a perfect attack and then if anything gets close to me while I'm firing I can blow them up with a big bomb and protect myself a little slower a little steadier but playing from range and then if something gets close I back away and I can blow them up or maybe I can run in drop that and leave there's a group of enemies coming through bam they're all dead this character alone can play completely different. Do you want to play close with range or do you close with range? Do you want to play close with like melee all the time or do you want to play ranged and explosions a little more protection? So my recommendation is start with the vigilante, get comfortable with dashing, 
The basic sword attacks are going to be a little bit faster. You're not going to be that strong at first. It's just going to take a little time to get used to. If you're comfortable with these games, go with the big rook. If you feel like you want to smash with power, that actually can be fun because if you do get in a pickle, you can throw your counter up and actually get your defense to kind of retaliate and be immune for that little bit of time. When you get to experiment more, you can take something like the specter with the claws and then we can go talk about weapon upgrades because those get to be a little crazy. So all the weapons have the ability to be upgraded. Now, if you take something like the sword, for example, I've got the ability to make the light attacks be up to 15% faster, the heavy attacks spin to be up to about 15% stronger, but these are the big ones. So just like the big nodes, like where you buy your first or your second dash, these cost emeralds, but they also will change how a weapon can work. So your light attack now is 30% stronger. That's just big alone because it's really fast, but it also has 30% more range. But if you flip it, you have the alternative of your light attack combo, your third attack being 60% stronger. Or maybe if you like to dash attack a lot, that can be stronger. If you come up here, now the heavy attack can go spin, spin really quickly in succession. This one is you can do 40% more damage if you take damage in a room. I would not recommend probably starting with something where you need to take damage, but spinning quickly twice, you can do a lot of work with that. So these weapon upgrades can really change the way weapons feel and do some drastic things to them. But the claws are probably one of the craziest ones because they're going to be quick for attacks and you can actually upgrade the light attacks. But what you can do, this is probably one of the weirdest ones I've seen and I still haven't looked through all of them. Hitting an enemy with your heavy attack will, will cause five damage to you but it will cause your light attack to restore health for every hit you do for a short time. So if you're playing with this character and you do a heavy attack, but then you know you can just unload with a whole bunch of light attacks, I'm back to 100 health. So even if I do 90, I'm at 98. So I know, depending on how I play this, the character, if I'm good at dodging, if I understand what the enemy attacks are going to do, maybe I've got multiple dodges, that's a point where I can go heavy and I know that I can really manage my health on my own. And if I need to, I can work on building it back up on those bigger, slower enemies. It's a bit of risk versus reward, but that play style can do a lot. And then if you lean into this character that does a lot of fast attacks, you might lean into some of the blessings that are going to lean into that. And that's kind of where it comes into builds. It's hard to tell any one person how to build into this because one, all of these blessings are always going to be very random. But when it comes to thinking about how they're going to synergize, that's probably the best thing you can do. So if you get a feel for each one of the symbols and what they're going to do, this one's going to be fire. So it's going to be your ignite, which is like a big damage hit one time and kind of fire related. You can also do a little bit of fire over time. But for your main abilities, it's going to cause an ignite. So every eight seconds, it's going to be a beast damage bonus. Oberon is all about precision and fury. So your light attacks, any of your attacks, they have the ability to stack the fury damage. And what that does is it stacks one up to 10, but then your attacks can do nearly twice as much. Well, if you put this on a big attack, you're not going to be hitting very often. So you're not going to be stacking it very quickly. But if your attack is very fast, like the claws, for example, you can stack the fury really high, really quickly. And that means your damage is going to be very, almost doubled very quickly when you stack that up. As long as you're doing damage with your claws, you're able to actually keep it going. Alternatively though, the claws could also stack venom very, very frequently. So this is a point to where depending on what you see, it's going to depend on what you think you might want to go with, but always it's going to be a lot of experimentation until you find something that works. So for example, maybe I have one big hit. Take the Vigilante's original spell. It's that big blade dash. Well, if I put the, the spell to be the ignite, I'm not going to use my spell very often because I have to wait for the mana to come back. But if I do wait every eight seconds to use that ability, every eight seconds, it's going to hit for 150% more damage at a minimum. So when I blast halfway across the map and through enemies, I'm going to hit them like a truck. So this is a point where ignite something that happens every eight seconds. I don't want that on like my light attack, for example, because it's not going to happen very often. But stacking Venom on a light attack when I can hit him five times in two seconds. Yeah, that's going to be really, really good. Now you've got some other options over here. You've got 
uh, Badib, the Dark Omen. This is like shadow and backstab and evasion and that type of, type of stuff. Uh, I mean, this has a chance to give you an extra dash, which could be really cool depending on what your build is like. But also you have backstab. Well, the Vigilante has a spell that will teleport you behind an enemy. You will deal bonus damage when striking an enemy from behind. So if you can get this spell thing from Badib for, and you have the backstab on the Vigilante, you can have this be a magical pairing because every time you use your spell, it's instantly going to be behind them. So you're going to get the backstab bonus. I did it once and it was kind of amazing how well it worked. So it's that type of thought process where you're going to start to see some success of what's going to be beneficial. Maybe I have turrets, you know, any of the turrets, either I plant them on the ground or I've got those things sitting on my shoulders. Okay, so depending on my build or whatever I've got going on, maybe the turrets can chill things. Okay, so that could be on my spell. Well, then if things are slower, I probably want to have a weapon that's got a little bit of range or some type of attack that's got some range. So maybe I've got the rook that's got, or not the rook, I've got the monk who's got a turret that I could put on the ground, but then my big staff has a big ranged attack, but if they're chilled, they're coming at me slower, so I've got slow targets that I can sit there and pummel with my light attack. Now, if I'm chilling them with my spell, just periodically plopping that down and the chilling is going on, maybe my slow but consistent light attack is something I might like to have a critical chance on. So every so often it hits for 200% damage. They're coming at me slow, so I've got the benefit of just wailing on them for a while, and every so often it just hits a bit harder. Something like this, the light attack being strong and stagger, the rook, when it has a big axe that's gonna cleave in a big area, you also have the ability to upgrade your weapon so you can have a perfect cleave, kind of like a the bow draw being perfect. If you do that like twice, you can stagger and then stun an enemy in about two big cleaves that are perfect because the damage is so big. Um, so that could be a really cool thing to put on your light attack. And then over here, your heavy attack, which would be more of that piercing shot, you could have that be stronger. And then if you pierce through a couple of enemies, you might weaken the ones that you hit along the way. Or maybe you want your spell to weaken all the enemies. So maybe that's something you put on as kind of a defensive build. And if you're playing in co-op, all of this gets even crazier because depending on what buffs you pick, or depending what buffs you pick versus what buffs the other players you're playing with pick, you might lean into more weaken and you might tell somebody with you, it's like, hey, I can make them weak. What you need to do is start stacking venom on them so they don't, so I can make sure they don't hit us that hard. You need to start stacking damage. And then for the melee player, if you're running claws, you need to be up there just wailing on them while they're weaker. And then if you got a fourth person with you, maybe they could focus on a little bit of chill. I mean, the synergies that you could get to and as a group talking could be absolutely bonkers and your success could be probably really, really high rate, I would imagine, as a solo player. It's a lot more about the randomness of what faces you. But when you think about what character you're playing, slow and big, fast and nimble, lots of attacks, little attacks, big, small, and how those pair with the buffs, that's where you're really gonna find the success. You're gonna mess some of these buffs up. Sometimes the options that you see are not gonna be that exciting. All of those things are gonna happen. That's the randomness of a roguelike. But when you start to kind of pair things up a little better, you'll find more success. You'll beat the mini boss, you'll beat the boss. You get to buy them too. Buy them two kicks your butt, okay? Then you work through, you get some more upgrades. Now I got a build that's really cooking. Okay, now I got spells that are um, hitting fury, so they're just wailing things the entire time. I've upgraded them four times, and then I'm over here. I can slow things down with my light attacks as I go through, and then the spell little turrets are just pelting things and just deleting everything around me, and I don't even have to be close to kill anything. There are a ton, an absolute ton of options in this game, but the combination of the weapons and how they play the spells and how they can kind of be a balance to how your weapon plays and then matching the right spell or the right weapon attack with the right blessing can make you insanely powerful to a point where you're just going to walk through each of the rooms and they're not even going to know what hits them so that kind of covers the characters the weapons the weapon upgrades and the blessings and that's the best way I can say it is that it's gonna be some experimentation, but think about the type of attack you have and then think about the buff you're picking up and if it matches with that type of attack. Quick attacks, bigger attacks, leftover attacks, big booms, speed, all of it's gonna kind of play in. And then when you really find the random rolls that make everything work, 
that's when the game clicks and that's when roguelikes really get their hooks in you on are a absolute ton of fun so hopefully you guys learned a thing or two and i'm hoping from what i've shown you here you guys are actually excited to try this out so my suggestion is use my link right there in the top of the description or the pinned comment you'll see it in both places whichever one's easier for you to find and that will take you over to steam and that's going to allow you to pick up the demo and the demo is live from june 10th to june 17th and you'll be able to play through Biome 1, which was in the opening, like, kind of announcement access demo, but also now in Biome 2, which definitely cranks up the challenge on a couple of those bosses that I've been working through. The game has a ton of potential, the combinations, the blessings, the weapons now, the upgrades are new, Sword of the Stone. There's a lot of features I've seen, as I've already probably put 30, 40 hours in this game before any of you have mostly seen it, and the progressions are great. So I suggest jumping in, it's free right now, check it out and follow this channel because more on sworn will be coming so thank you all very much thank you team 17 for the sponsor and just letting me put this video together so good luck out there in camelot and um hopefully we'll all slay king arthur at some point in the future